good morning. Welcome to Radiant Church Online. We are so glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, we continue to hope and pray that things continue to get better with the coronavirus and hope that we are on a upward trajectory of getting through this and hope that we may start seeing more of you out to our in-person service at some point in the upcoming uh, weeks and months and are certainly looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to continue doing this online service uh, indefinitely. Uh, we also hope that we'll have a live stream available soon. We had some experiments with it last week uh, and hope that uh, we're going to be getting that uh, better and better in the upcoming weeks and we'll be able to give you a, the live version of what's going on and be able to see some of your friends, see other people participating in the service. Uh, it's just been harder to involve those in the um, online version. So uh, thank you for participating and it's been a difficult year in so many ways and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you but hope that through technology we can continue uh, being together in this way and encouraging you in your walk with the Lord. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts uh, chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 26 through 40 today. We're continuing our series in the book of Acts. One of our prayers for our church is that we would just be getting back to the basics and so we're looking at this book, the New Testament, uh, that gives us a glimpse of the early church and what they were doing and we're just praying that it allows us to get back to the basics and really create a movement of people who are following Jesus and are helping others to follow Jesus. So be praying for us uh, as we study this book and, and reformat our church. Uh, this is our prayer for our church. And uh, before we read this, uh, let me just pray and ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, we thank you so much for your word that is a light to our path. It guides us, instructs us, and helps us to know you. And we just pray that you would bless the reading and teaching of your word today. Help each of us to press in, to engage with what you would say to us, and help us to be changed through your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, last week in the book of Acts, we saw that opposition was increasing to the early church. And we actually see that, that opposition increases to a point where the first martyr, Stephen, is killed for his faith. What people were intending to thwart the church, they were using these things to put the church down, it actually ends up being something that God uses for good. What they intended for harm, God intends for good. And it's actually that persecution that allows the church to go beyond the, the walls of the city of Jerusalem for the first time. The, the gospel goes outside of Jerusalem because opposition had increased. And today we're going to read about Philip. Uh, Philip the evangelist, he uh, goes out, he meets a person, and we see him bring this person to faith. And so it's going to help us understand what our calling as believers is and what we should be engaging in and what our role is in evangelism. The main point that we see today is that followers of Christ are to help others follow Christ. And they're to do that by being guides to God's word. We are followers of Christ. We want to help others follow Christ. And the way we do that is by pointing people to God's word. We, we want to be a guide, someone who comes alongside them and helps show them the way. Not, not the sage with all the answers, but simply a guide that tries to point them, walk with them, and help them understand what God is doing. We're going to see that Philip does this, and we're going to start reading in verse 26. This is Acts chapter 8, 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? And Philip opened his mouth 
And beginning with this scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through. He preached the gospel to all the towns he came to Caesarea. That's the word of the Lord. So I want to go through and point out a few things about this passage. Uh, first thing to see is that uh, there is spirit-led obedience. Philip is following the Lord. We talked about being followers of Christ who are helping others follow Christ. The only way we're going to help others follow Christ is if we are first following Christ. If we are being obedient to his call. Verse 26, we see an angel speaks to Philip saying, go. And what does Philip do? He goes. He didn't delay. He he went. Uh, Verse 29, the spirit says to Philip, go over to his chariot and read. And Philip goes over and he reads. He is obedient to what God is calling him to do. Now, we don't need angels appearing to us to tell us that we need to share the gospel. Jesus is very clear of that in his word. We need to be willing to be obedient to that. We need to ask ourselves if we are willing to follow Christ in everything, if we are willing to tell others who he is and what he's done. It's very clear that Philip, he's looking for opportunities to be used by God. He is looking for opportunities to be obedient. We also see in verse 35, it says that he opened his mouth could have, could have just said he spoke. Uh, it says that later. He told him the good news, but there's just an emphasis here that being faithful witnesses means that we open our mouths, that, that we talk, that we speak, that we share words of insight. We have to ask ourselves if we are willing to be used of God by that. We have to ask ourselves if we are training and preparing to follow God in that call to help others follow Christ. The only way we're going to help others follow Christ is if we are first willing to follow Christ. Second thing I want to point out here is that there is guidance for unconverted worshipers. This is what Philip does. He is a guide for an unconverted worshiper. This Ethiopian, he is an interesting person. Uh, First of all, Ethiopia is about 1,600 miles from Jerusalem. So we see how God, his intent has always been to draw all people to himself. He's drawn this Ethiopian to himself. He's a, he's a eunuch. Uh, you can ask your parents what that means. Uh, but it's a reminder there's, there's always been confusion about sexuality in societies. Um, this was normally done with people that they wanted to make sure they were loyal and trusted servants of the, the royalty. This person is obviously a, an important official in his land. But he comes to Jerusalem to worship. And what's interesting is that he is on his way home and he's confused. He's sitting in his chariot reading the scroll of Isaiah, reading the book of Isaiah and wondering, what does this mean? Now, we don't know if he went to the worship service and it just raised more questions and answers. Or we don't know if maybe in the worship service they taught this passage and he needs further further understanding of it. But he's reading God's word. He's a worshiper, but he doesn't understand what the scriptures say. We need to embrace times like that. We need to recognize that many people may be coming into church, may be coming in to read God's word and they don't understand it. They, they need help. The Ethiopian is a great picture of that. And, and, you know, some people may say, well, you know, this is just easy evangelism, right? I mean, does it get any easier than walking up to somebody and they're sitting in their car reading the prophet Isaiah, reading Isaiah 53, and wondering, who is this talking about? Will someone explain to me who the Savior of the world is? Um, That's as easy as it gets. I wish we had some more of those, right? Now, one of the things that I think about this is that, yes, it does seem like a rather easy opportunity for Philip. But I would also put this on the church of the time. Because as we have read through the book of Acts, we have seen the church praying and praying earnestly for the gospel to go forward. This is one of their consuming desires. And so we see it happening. We see God answering their prayers. People are being converted. I think this is one thing to challenge us today. Are we praying and longing for God to draw people to himself? 
Are we praying for people to have their eyes open to who Jesus Christ is and what he's done? You know, so often in the church, we, we look around and we don't see many conversions. Uh, but, but we all go home to our big luxurious houses with all the amenities. And sometimes I wonder, maybe God is answering our prayers. Maybe he is giving us what we are crying out for. We are crying out for more amenities in our houses rather than the souls of people. And I think at times that shows you just how anemic the, the fervency of the church can be. You have to ask yourself, do you long for that? Do you long to see people saved? That should be a burden for the church. It was a burden in the early church and God is answering that prayer. Verse 31, we see that Philip's role is to be a guide. The Ethiopian cries out, how can I understand this unless someone guides me in it? Philip walks through this passage with him. He explains it. And, and we're reminded that the way God normally uses, what God normally does to draw people to himself is he uses other people. And he is using Philip to draw this Ethiopian to himself. He, he's a guide. That, that word guide, it, it literally, it is used of someone that would come along the side the road and, and walk with you, show you the way to, to be an escort. Um, Jesus uses this in Matthew 15, 14. He said, if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. It's that idea of coming alongside, maybe someone who's blind, someone who can see comes alongside and, and shows them the way. That's what Philip is called to do, is come alongside. The, the man needs to be walking, but Philip is going to direct him and guide him. This is what we need to be doing in church. This is what believers are to be. We're to be guides for others. We're to point others to what Jesus has done. This is our goal in growing in Christ likeness. This is our goal in, in being disciples. We want to be discipled so that we can be guides for other people. And we have to ask ourselves, is our, our ministries in the church equipping us to be guides for other people? If they aren't equipping us to be guides, then what are we doing? Are we experiencing more fruitfulness in seeing others come to faith and, and others grow in their faith? I think this is a key question for us to ask, key question for churches across the board to ask, but also one particularly for us. And I want to get at this a little bit later. We'll come back to this. But another thing that we see in this passage is that Philip gets close enough to this Ethiopian that the Ethiopian is willing to ask him questions. He's willing to ask him questions. Philip moved towards him. It, we need to be moving towards people. You know, we can't control if they're going to receive our teaching, if they're going to receive what we have to say about Christ. But we can control if they recognize we care enough that they are willing to ask us questions. If, if we're not willing to even get close enough to talk to them, for them to feel comfortable sharing their, their thoughts, their concerns, their questions about the Bible, then there's a problem. And we have to ask ourselves, why aren't we willing to do that? We need to be putting ourselves in a position to be good friends, to, to be like Philip who drew near to the Ethiopian, got into his chariot and started reading the Bible with him. That's what we're called to do. You know, I'm, I'm reading a book right now uh, by Wendell Berry and it's called Jaber Crow. Uh, Jaber uh, is a, a guy's name, and he is actually in seminary. Uh, feels called to ministry, but he begins to have questions. When he brings up questions like, if Jesus said not to pray in public, why do we pray in public? Or uh, if Jesus said to love our enemies, why do we kill them? He brings these questions up to his professors, and they simply look at him and say, you just need to have more faith. You just need to believe. And they tell him that these questions are a sign of weakness. That's grieving to me because there are good answers to these questions that they could have pointed them to, but they don't do that. And Jaber's time in seminary ends with him going to a professor to ask these questions. And his professor, who just simply wants to sit in his office reading a book, offers Jaber no help, no dialogue, and finally, he just agrees with Jaber. Jaber says, it would be hard to preach if I don't have answers to these questions. And his professor nods. And then he leads him in the next conclusion. It says, if you're not going to preach, then why are you in school here? And with that, Jaber decides to withdraw from school. Very sad 
conclusion to this is as Jaber starts to walk out the door, he realizes he should turn and thank his professor for spending a little bit of time with him. And as he turns around to tell his professor thank you, he realizes that his professor has already gone back to reading his book and hasn't even noticed Jaber walking out the door. His professor is completely unintuned with Jaber's needs. And it's sad. There's no effort. There's no concern. It is a giant swing and miss with sharing the gospel. And I would say that it was not just a giant swing and miss with sharing the gospel. I think that it's a giant swing and miss of understanding the gospel. When we understand what Jesus has done for us, we, we want to share that with others. When we see that he came, he came to us. When we were dead in our sins, he came to us and shared and brought us life. We want to go to others. We want to meet them in their needs. We want to meet them in their weakness. We want to meet them in their questions. You can't be a guide if you don't know where people are struggling. You can't be a guide if you don't know the questions that they have. You know, when somebody raises a question, that is holy ground. That is a, a sacred moment when, when somebody opens up and says, I don't understand this passage. Who, who is this prophet talking about? Yeah, I had a moment this last week where one of my kids was struggling with something and had a question. And it could be very easy to say, hey, you just need to, don't ask those questions, just do what I say. But as they raised those questions and we started dialoguing on it, it was just this incredibly sweet moment in which there were some some dots were connected for them in, in, their, in their minds. And it just, it, it led to such a wonderful conversation. We need to be willing to engage in talk with people about their questions. We need to make sure they feel comfortable bringing questions to us. We need to make sure they know that we care. This is what our calling as guides is to be. This is the Great Commission. This is what we're called to do, to share God's word, to help people understand all that Jesus commands. The church should be telling others about Jesus and teaching them to obey all that he commands. Now, you may not have all the answers. It doesn't, being willing to answer people's questions doesn't mean we know everything, but it means that we're willing to engage them. It means when they ask things, we don't just walk away from it and say, I, I don't know. We say, well, here's what I think about that. This is something that's helped me through that. We engage with them. Hey, does that make sense to you? What do you think? And where they may have questions that we don't know, we can say things like, well, hey, I tell you what, why don't you go look up some stuff on that? I'll go look up some stuff on it and let's come back and talk through this. We don't dodge the question. We don't turn away from it. We want to help people. We want to come alongside and guide them. We need to have that fervency and the mission, the fervency to tell others about Jesus that we're willing to press into those things with people to understand where they're at and to try and help them find answers to their questions. Reading this passage, it makes me think, how many people might come into the doors of our church and walk out with questions? Walk out being unsure about some of the things that we talk about. And one of the things that really makes me wonder is how many people would like to have someone come alongside and guide them, but nobody is there to do it. Are we willing to engage in that? Are we looking for opportunities for, to engage people who come in, to go towards them, to see how is their experience at church? What questions do they have? What is going on in your life? How can I be praying for you? We need to think about our church. We are an army of people, and, and we are trying to, to go out to reach others for Christ. We're not just coming in so things can be easy for us. We're coming in to serve others, to look to care for others. This is what we're called to do. We need to be guides for those who don't know Jesus. We need to be guides for those who may be seeking answers for the first time in their life. We need to be those who, who may be coming to the church for the first time in 20 years. Are they gonna come in and experience help and guidance? in their times of darkness and loneliness and isolation? Or are they just gonna experience silence and no one to ask their questions to? I, I want to challenge you. Yeah, I know this is online, but at some point, Lord willing, you are gonna come back to church. And I wanna ask you to come back with the mentality of looking for people 
that you can reach out to. Come back with the attitude of, of how can I get to know this person? It's maybe their first time, maybe their first time in a long time. Or maybe you just see somebody that has been coming to church, you've known them for years, but it just looks like they're struggling. There may be current members who are struggling and need some help. You can be a guide for them. We wanna be a guide for those who, who, who are going through difficult times. That's what Philip is. That's what Jesus calls us to do. Next thing I wanna look at is just the power of the word to save. The power of the word is, is obvious in this. You know, this, this passage points out our need for guides and also our need for scripture. It points out the gift of teachers and also the gift of the scriptures. This is why we read God's word because God's word changes us. This man's being changed by his reading of God's word. And, and let me tell you this, as you get to know people, as you hear some of the questions that they may have, there may be big questions. You may feel like you just saw somebody, they looked nice, went out to lunch, I asked them what's going on, and then they just dropped this giant plate of spaghetti on me. Their life is so confused and knotted up and tangled, I don't know what to do. And it can be overwhelming. Well, here's the thing, you're not their savior. It's not your job to figure everything out. Sometimes you, you look at people, you hear where they're at, and you say, man, you're in a tough spot. There is a lot that you need to work through, and it's not all going to get resolved in this one conversation, and I don't have all the answers. But I tell you what I will do. If you commit to taking your walk with God seriously, and you commit to trying to follow Him, I will come alongside. I will be by your side. I'll be your, your greatest cheerleader and I'll keep pointing you in the direction to go. I can't solve everything for you, but I'll come alongside and walk with you. That's what we need to do. It, it, it's on them. They need to read God's word. We want to encourage them with it and point them in the direction that they need to go. Maybe give them some advice here and there, but it's not our job to save people. It's our job to point people to Christ. And we need to do that by engaging in God's word, by pointing them to the word. You know, this is one of the things, as we talk about being followers of Christ, we're helping others follow Christ, it comes back to being in God's Word. If we're not pointing them to God's Word, we're not pointing them to how they can follow Christ. And if we're not doing that, then we are not leading anybody spiritually. Let me say this, if you are not engaging with others around God's Word, you are not leading anybody spiritually. Parents, think about that as you work with your kids. Are, are you engaging in God's Word with them? Spouses, how are you helping one another? Men, how are you leading in your families? If you are not engaging God's word with your family, you are not leading. We need, if you're gonna be a leader in your family or wherever you're at, if you're gonna be a spiritual leader, it is going to involve getting into God's word and talking about it with others, hearing from them, hearing what they see, talking through the questions that come up. This is what we're called to be and do as God's people. We need to see the power of God's word to save, the power of God's word to change. This is our hope, that the Spirit works through the word of God. And we need to make sure that we are getting into it with others. Next thing I want to point out is that Philip's advice is Jesus-centered. You know, the Ethiopian, he has a problem. You can tell there's some concern and anxiety. He is trying to figure out who is the prophet speaking to. And it points to Jesus. You know, Jesus is God's solution to all of the problems that are in the world. Jesus is the savior of the world. He can save us from all things. So whatever problems, whatever hardships, what, whatever those things are that we face in life that we don't know what to do with, Jesus is ultimately the solution to all of those. And that is not an exaggeration. That is the gospel truth. The Bible points to Jesus as being the one that, that the curse, all the, all the things that have gone wrong in the world are going to be made right in Jesus. And so as we experience the stresses of life, the anxieties, the fears that come up, all of those things should ultimately point us to Jesus. We see that here in this passage. They are reading Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah 53, in which it is a powerful passage about a suffering servant coming into the world to give his life as a atoning sacrifice for sin. We are saved through the death of Jesus. 
This is the good news of the gospel. It means that you can be forgiven for all your mistakes. It means that you have a savior that you can look to, that you can follow, that will lead you in everything that you should do. It means that all of your fears and anxieties can be calmed in him. We rest in him, but we have to submit our lives to him. It's like a fork in the road. We, we are going one way. By nature, we are just following the ways of the world, but God offers us salvation in Christ. And in order to experience that, we have to turn to Christ. We have to come to a fork in the road and say, you know what? I've been following the ways of the world, but now I'm going to follow Christ. I've been going this way, and now I'm going to go that way. We need to follow Christ. We need to make a decision that he is going to be the Lord of our lives, that we are going to look to him as our ultimate God, as our chief shepherd, and we begin to follow him. Because if we haven't made that decision for him to be our Lord and Savior and our guide in everything, then it means we're just following the ways of the world. There, there's no middle ground. It's one or the other. Either we are living for the world or we're living for Jesus. And I also, you know, if you, have, if you have never made that decision before, I want to encourage you to make that decision to say, you know what, I'm going to stop living for the world, stop living for myself, and I'm going to live for Jesus. That's what it means to be brought to faith, to, to, to trust Jesus, to become a Christian. It means that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. But I also want to encourage you, if you are a believer, maybe you've been a believer for a long time, but you have been ignoring Jesus' call to discipleship. You have been ignoring Jesus' call to follow him and to help others follow him. I want to tell you that this is a time for you to make a decision too. You can't just keep going down the road saying you're following Jesus, but you're ignoring everything he tells you to do. You need to make a decision that you're really going to make him your Lord and Savior. You can't just give lip service and, and live one way and profess to be something else. That's called hypocrisy. Jesus calls you to follow him. Jesus calls you to help others follow him. Jesus calls you to be a disciple who is making other disciples. And you have to make a decision that you're going to follow him in that. If you're not following him in that, then you just continue to follow the world as well. You gotta come to a fork in the road. This passage points us to that. And this Ethiopian, he chooses Christ. He's baptized and he begins following Jesus. That's how we're to respond to the gospel as well. I want to transition at this point. I want to talk about something that I think is going to help our church get more on board with the Great Commission. We've talked about discovery groups over the last few months, and I want to talk about that some more. This passage really points to why we are doing discovery groups. Discovery groups are a way to equip more people, to connect them with others, and to engage with God's Word. That's why we're doing this. Now, we're calling them discovery groups because as I've talked to people, uh, most people have been in a small group. Most people have been in a community group, uh, various things like that. Not, I haven't talked to hardly anybody that has ever been in a discovery group. That's why we're using this name because we're trying to do something new. Discovery groups have, we've got a pamphlet. We've handed that to you before. We've updated that pamphlet recently. And I want to talk through some of that with you because our goal in discovery groups, we want to get into the Bible. We want to build relationally with other people, and we want to, to, to move forward in mission. Those have been three priorities we've had as a church, and we feel like these discovery groups are moving us in that direction. A lot of people have been part Bible studies. You come into a Bible study, you study the passage, you have a, uh, maybe a worksheet that you go through, and it is focused on that. Oftentimes, you don't really get to know what's going on in other people's lives. It's just focused on the Bible. Some people have been in community groups where there may be a little bit of Bible, but it's more just come in and let's do life, talk about what's going on. Um, and so people come and share all the good, the bad, the ugly from their week, and they connect with others. Some people have been in maybe missional groups where it is about engaging non-believers. So you don't talk about the Bible much. You don't talk about your life in depth. It is just a, a let's, let's hang out with people who don't know Jesus. Let's show the love of Christ to them. And let's hope that through that we begin to get opportunities to talk. Discovery groups are combining all of these to, to some degree or another. And I want to walk you through some of this. We just believe it's important that we are engaging in God's word. We believe it's important that we're really getting to know what's going on in people's lives. I've realized that a lot of people will come into Bible studies. 
They'll talk about the Bible, but then we never know what's really going on in their life. You can be in a Bible study and half the people in there are going to counseling somewhere else and you have no idea why they're in counseling. You don't really know them. You are not getting an opportunity to talk to them about the questions they have. So maybe we're being greedy, but we want some of all of these in our groups. And this is what we're trying to do with discovery groups. Discovery groups are going to allow people to get into God's word and allow some guides to come alongside them. Uh, if you have your booklet, you can flip to that. I'm just gonna walk through a couple things. I wanna reiterate why we're doing these. Um, the new booklet, uh, you'll see the discussion questions on pages six and seven, um, and I just wanna walk through that. Uh, I wanna tell you why we're doing these things. Uh, first, we're trying to build in community and relationally with people. Questions one and two in this is, uh, what are you grateful for? What is stressing you out? Uh, some people call this the, the highs and lows, or what, what are you grateful for? What's eating your lunch? Uh, I heard somebody say they call it the happy and crappy of life. Um, but just talk through, what are you grateful for? What's stressing you out? It allows you to really get to know other people and what's going on, and as you get to know others, you're gonna become more and more aware of what's going on in their life. We need to understand where people really need prayer. This is a way to get at that. Uh, we also see that there's a place on these to talk about needs, uh, just to train us to be looking out in the world where you know, who are the people in my life that may have needs that we could help meet um, we do things on a corporate level as a church, you know, North Fulton Community Charities, a Beacon of Hope. We love doing that. But we also want to be encouraging you to be on the lookout for needs of people in your life. This helps us to get at that. You also see a big part of these discovery groups is Bible study. We want to get in God's Word. If we're not engaging in God's Word, then, then something is wrong. Um, the questions here are meant to get people thinking about God's word. It, it's meant to train them to think through God's word. We're trying to instill good habits around God's word. It's not just the content that's here, it's these habits. Some of these questions are here. What grabbed your attention? Uh, what does this passage tell me about God, myself, and the world we live in? That's an incredible question. If you just wake up in the morning, read your Bible and say, what does this tell me about God? What does it tell me about myself? What does it tell me about the world we live in? Those are deep, profound questions. It can take just a few minutes to answer that will really shape you. Engage with God's word. One of the questions here is what bothered you in the passage? We wanna make it easy for people to talk about what they don't understand or, or what they struggle with. And we know everybody, when we come to a passage, there may be things that you don't understand. We want to share what we don't get, and we hope that as others come into it, they'll feel welcome and, and, and free to share their questions. We want to hear where they're at. This is a way to engage with that. We also see that uh, question six is about obeying. We need to be shaped by God's word. We need to read God's word and think, how does that impact me? What do I need to do? Philip obeyed the spirit. If we are going to be faithful to what Jesus calls us to do, we need to obey him. Too many people just come into God's word wanting God to meet their needs, God to fulfill their dreams. We need to be people that are submitting our lives to God and his plan for us. This is a question that we need to ask ourselves. What do I need to do? How do I respond to God's word? And then question seven, the last question on here is about sharing. Sharing with other people. You know, too many Christians and too many discipleship curriculums ignore the call to share with others. We need to see here that as we read God's word, we should think about what we can share with others. And if you've just come into Bible study, you're stressed about something, you've read God's word, and you see that you need to do something, then there should be an overflow from that, that you are seeing God's word shape and change you and encourage you, and you want to share that with others. I mean, if we just take the passage that we read today from, from Acts 8 and say, what, what do I need to do? How do I respond to this, to, to being a guide? I, I mean, if a guy came up and said, you know what, I read that passage and I realized I need to lead better in my home. I'm not leading with God's word. I'm just coming home. I want to sit on the couch and watch TV and just relax and do nothing and not be burdened with any of the kids. I realize I'm being selfish and, and, and I see God calls me to be a guide and I want to do that. Man, that's deeply encouraging. 
You think about if a guy said that to you, you would be encouraged. Well, if God is shaping you, share that with other people. Share it with somebody in the church. Share it with your, your, your neighbors, your coworkers. They're going to be amazed to see, man, something's going on in that guy. God is working in his life. We, we want to be doing that. That's going to be a way that we shape and help others. Again, our goal is that we take people deeper in God's word and create new habits around God's word with reading, obeying, and sharing. That's what we want to do. And, and I hope that when you see these Bible studies, you look at it and say, wow, I, I can do that. I, I can do that. I want to do it. Because I believe for us to reach more people, we need more people engaging in discipleship. We need more people coming alongside to be guides and helping others along the way. And I believe that these discovery groups are going to help us to do that. I have a picture I, I want to show. Uh, this picture uh, is of me and Amanda at Savannah. We went there a couple weeks ago, just did a getaway. I uh, had a fantastic time going through. And this picture is of uh, St. John the Baptist uh, Cathedral. It is just an impressive building. There were several buildings like this in downtown Savannah. Now, I don't know all the history on this church or the other churches down there, but it is an impressive building outwardly. I don't know what's going on inside. I poked around a little bit, and there's some life, some membership still there, but I don't think it's a whole lot. And I thought, man, right here in downtown Savannah, you probably have a hundred, hundred million dollars in church buildings and not a whole lot of life. These buildings are more relics. They're more just monuments pointing to what's been done in the past. And as I saw that, you know, when I first saw that, I thought, man, wouldn't it be neat to, to preach in a building like that? But then I thought about it and I thought, man, if I could do anything, I, I don't want a big building. I'm not interested in creating a monument. I'm more interested in creating a movement a movement of people following Christ and helping others follow Christ. That's what is happening in the book of Acts. That's what God calls the church to be and to do. Are we willing to do that? Are we looking for opportunities to do that? I think this is our calling as a church to create a movement of that, to create a movement of people following Jesus who are helping others follow Jesus. And one of my goals in, in these discovery groups, I would love to take 100 people through one of these journeys. And if you look in the book, there's journeys and there's eight to 10 Bible readings on each journey. I'd love to get 100 adults going through that. Now, I know that's probably twice the adult membership of our church, and that's the point. I want to get our members engaging in this and engaging with others, taking it to the people in, in their social networks, your social networks, so that you can make a difference in their lives so that you can help guide and lead others spiritually. That's what God calls us to do. And I believe that these discovery groups are giving us a form of doing small groups, of doing ministry in which we can do it in the church and then take it outside the walls of the church as well. There, there's a video that we provided for you. We couldn't put it on the online uh, service. Uh, but there's a link in your bulletin. Uh, it is called a Disciple Making Movement, uh, and it's on the Discovery Group tab. I want you to scroll down and take a look at that. It's going to show you a picture of what we're trying to do in Discovery Groups. It's trying to create people in the church going outside the church and helping others to know Christ. This is our goal in discipleship. This is what we should be doing in all of our discipleship in the church, and I believe that these Discovery Groups are uniquely positioned to help us to do that. So we're going to need more people wanting to participate in discovery groups. We're going to need people that are willing to facilitate discovery groups. So if you look in your bulletin, you'll also see a spot that uh, there's discovery groups and you can sign up to say, hey, I'm interested in being a part of one of these. We would love to see more people engaging and participating. Again, we've been piloting these and feel like we're seeing really good fruit. They're, they're not easy, but we believe it's worth trying to do these right. And we believe that as we start doing that, we're gonna see more fruit. We're gonna see people, our long-term members, our new members growing, and we're gonna to start to see more people coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So we wanna pray for that, and I need you. Uh, we need our church to, to rally around this. And so I wanna ask you to consider being a part of one, joining a group, helping lead one. 
We need to create a movement and it's gonna take all of us going all in, praying for God to do a, a movement, praying for God to shape us and change us. And so I wanna ask you to pray about being a part of that. Uh, let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you that we have a purpose in life, a purpose that goes beyond our work, a purpose that goes beyond just providing as a dad or a mom. You call us to shape others on the deepest level of human relationship, which is our relationship with you. And God, that is such an incredible privilege to be a part of. And we pray that you would shape us as believers. God, have your way in us. Help us to change and to hear your voice calling us. And God, I pray that you would, we've been praying that you would do whatever it takes to build a healthy church here, God. And we just pray for this next step. We pray that you would help us to launch out in mission, engaging with others in God's word, engaging in answering questions and helping others to know you. And I just pray for those who may not know you, who aren't walking with you, but they, they sense a need to follow you. God, I pray that you would draw them to yourself. I pray that they would make a decision to say, I'm not gonna live for the world, I am living for Jesus. And I just pray for some of those who maybe they, they would profess to be a believer for a long time, but they have not been following you and what you call them to do. They've not been helping to make disciples. They've not been guiding others. Lord, I just pray that you would help them to make that decision to truly follow you. And I just pray that as they do that, they would just have a new excitement, that they would be stirred by you and what you're doing, and they would give themselves fully and completely to it. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before you go, I have a few announcements. We'll go through those real quick. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you have any questions about today's message, reach out to us. I'd love to talk to you, engage with you. Uh, and again, uh, if you look in your bulletin that's emailed to you, uh, if you're not receiving the bulletin, email us at hello at radiantchurchga.com and we'll get you on our email list. Uh, but if you look on your bulletin, there's a spot for discovery groups and you'll find a way to sign up uh, you'll also see that there is a link to the Disciple Making Movement video. It's a neat video that just helps you to see and understand what we're trying to do through discovery groups. Um, also, we mentioned baptism. Uh, if you are interested in being baptized or if you just have questions about baptism, we would love to talk to you about that. Baptism is a way we profess our faith in Jesus Christ. It's a way that we declare that we were following the world, but now Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We're following him. If you're a Christian and you have not been baptized, you should be baptized. If you don't have someone to talk to about that, come talk to us. And this is, again, one of these things. Don't delay in that. This is an opportunity for you to be obedient to Christ, to put aside all your other fears and to follow him. So if you're following Christ, you haven't been baptized, you should be baptized. You should follow him in that. Uh, talk to us if you have questions. Uh, also want to mention that we are doing youth group today after church. Uh, you see that in the bulletin. Uh, the boys and girls will be meeting. And uh, if you have not been a part of that, but you're interested, let us know. We would love to get some more uh, of our youth in there. Uh, also want to mention uh, just tithes and offering. Uh, we want to honor the Lord in everything, every part of life. We honor him with our singing, with our time. We want to honor him with our finances. Um, we have a verse from Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Uh, just a reminder that we want to honor the Lord first and foremost in everything, with our time, with our talent, with our treasure. Uh, giving is a way that we just demonstrate that. We are honoring the Lord. We are trusting him. And so if you see your bulletin, there's uh, different ways that you can give to the church. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, there's multiple ways. If you have questions, let us know. We'd be glad to talk to you. Again, thank you so much for being a part of our service. Uh, we hope that we'll start seeing more and more of you in the upcoming weeks and months. We're looking forward to, Lord willing, some point this year, having our whole uh, church family back in the building in one place. We're praying for that and just eager to experience that. Uh, we hope that you have a great Sunday, a great week, and just wanna remind you our vision as a church, we wanna worship God, love others, and make a difference in the world. So I wanna encourage you to find a way to go out, make a difference, 
in the lives of the people around you. Another way we say that is go out and be radiant. Thanks so much for joining with us. Talk to you later. Have a great week. Bye.